Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, we're delighted to have Ron Mayfield from Texas. He's going to be tying some deer hair flies for warm and salt water. In our weekly tip, we're going to delve a little further into UV. We're the Beaties from Boise, Idaho, and joining us tonight is our friend Ron Mayfield. And Ron is going to be tying some, some flies for us. We're going to start by um, get rid of the okay. Ron has been fishing since he was four years old and fly fishing and fly tying since he was 13. That's more than 50 years. You're kind of telling your age there, Ron. Growing, yep. up, in the, growing up on the Texas <laughs> Gulf Coast, Ron specializes in tying warm water and saltwater fly patterns and is known for his innovative deer hair patterns such as the lily pad jumping frog, the mohawk, the mohawk minnow pinfish featured in Fly Tire magazine, and the Umpqua Rattle Mump Mullet. Many of his fly designs are effective in Texas Big Lake, uh, big Bass Lakes, on saltwater flats, and in the surf near and offshore. And Ron, uh, tell us a little bit about being an Umpqua fly designer. I've always been interested in that before you get into your actual program. So I've been with Umpqua for well over 20 years. And Umpqua is a great company, as we all know in that they take innovative patterns from tires and then mass produce them. And then they give those people a royalty. But uh, you're not going to get rich doing this. I'm up to about $20 a month in royalties. So, but it's, it's a really good company in that you can submit patterns to them. And if it is an innovative pattern, if it's, if, if they can get the materials for it, that's one of the criteria. And if they think they can sell it, then they will put you under an agreement, a contract, and then they will, you, you create a video on how to tie your fly. And then they train people overseas to tie it and mass produce it. And then they sell it in stores across the world. Great. So well, what, are you, what are you going to be tying for us tonight, Ron? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to first show you a technique. So I've created a deer hair technique I call flaring. And it's a bit different than the typical techniques of spinning and stacking hair. And as you can see from the fly uh, in the video, that this technique allows you to be very specific on where you put deer hair. Many years ago, and I came up with this technique 20, 25 years ago, I wanted to be able to mimic bait fish. So as a kid, I spent a lot of time in the water with my snorkel, chasing fish around in the crystal clear streams of the Texas Hill Country. And I, I saw what they looked like. And I wanted to be able to mimic that. And with spinning and stacking, I couldn't really get those horizontal, I'm sorry, vertical lines that you see on a bait fish. So I experimented and over time, I came up with this particular technique. So I'm gonna show you the technique, not so much tie a fly, I'm gonna show you the technique and then show you what you can do with this technique. All the different variations of flies that you can tie. Because with this technique, you can be very creative. You can mimic bait fish or frogs or salamanders or whatever you have in your ecosystem. So with that, I guess we'll get started. This is the Mohawk minnow. It's the sunfish pattern. And I didn't name it this. The guys in my club, the Texas fly fishers in Houston, named it the Mohawk minnow. And... This design came from a concept out of a book called Bassing with a Fly Rod by Jack Ellis. He described what he called the secondary hatch. The primary hatch is a hatch of, well, in Texas, we have a lot of mosquitoes, mosquitoes and mayflies. And then the secondary hatch is when the sunfish come up and feed on those, those bugs on top of the water, the bass come and feed on the sunfish. So the secondary hatch is the bass feeding on the sunfish. So this pattern was designed to mimic a sunfish as it's feeding on the surface. So this pattern sits in the water just about like this with the water line just about right there. And when you retrieve it, it dives down. That curved nose causes it to dive down and then it floats back up. What the Mohawk does 
It's there for a reason. It pulls a couple of bubbles underwater. Those of you who fish for sunfish have probably seen when a sunfish sucks a bug off the water, it sucks in a little bit of air and it forms a bubble. It actually makes a little slurping sound. So that mohawk pulls in some bubbles and it kind of sounds like a sunfish sucking a bug off the water. And one of the other concepts here is when you look at it from this direction, you can see that there's like a keel that the profile looks like a sunfish, but there's very little hair on the bottom side of the hook. There's a reason for that. I wanted the profile, so when a bass is looking at it from the side, it's gonna have the profile of a sunfish, but and here's the tricky part. If the hair that's underneath the shank has more buoyancy than the weight of the hook from the curve to the point, you got that? If the hair underneath the shank has more buoyancy than the weight of the hook from the curve down to the point, the fly will do this. It'll turn sideways and sit on top of the water sideways. And it won't have that action that I'm after where it sits in the water just like this. And when you pull it, it dies. So that's one of the techniques I'm gonna show you here in a little bit. So you're balancing the fly is essentially what you're doing by taking some of the ballast out of the bottom that you don't want. That's exactly right. Some of the, because deer hair, as we all know, is hollow and it floats. It's like, a, if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a soda straw with sponge in it. And that, that's why it floats. Um, so I'm going to start with the technique. So how can you get these color variations on the flies? And you can see, and I have lots of people ask me, so did you do that with a magic marker? Uh, no, that's actually black dyed hair in those thin stripes and altering orange and yellow on the bottom to give all those horizontal stripes like you see on a sunfish. So we'll jump into the technique of flaring hair first. I'm just going to take a bare hook and start tying just to show the technique. And I'm not going to sit here and tie all the hair on the hook because that gets kind of boring after a while. So uh, if I remember right, you had Mike George on recently. Is that correct? Yes, it sure is. He was on uh, a couple of nights ago with the Pro Series. Yeah. So if you all saw Mike, Mike has taken spinning and stacking to the level of art. He's amazing. He and I have been tying at shows on and off together for over 20 years. But my technique is very different than what he does. So I'm so question to the audience. Do you want me to cover spinning and stacking so you can see the difference, or you want me to go right into flaring here? You go ahead and, and make your presentation the way you feel is best. Uh, and you can okay. start by, by telling us about the weight on your bobbin. <laughs> I had a feeling you're going to ask about that. So as you can see, I've got uh, this weight, and this is a lead egg weight. It's a six ounce egg weight that I cut. I put it in a vise and I cut the bottom off of it and I drilled a hole in it so that the stem of my bobbin would go through it. And that's very important for this technique. And I'll show you why. Let me get some hair on here. So this technique is also very fast. So I'm going to take the hair and I don't comb it or anything like that. All I do is I spread it out a little bit and I get that undercoat off. And that's it. So it goes very fast. Okay, so this is a technique where you're using three fingers, which is why I've got the camera from the uh, front of the fly. And is that working okay, Al? Can you see that? Yeah, it looks like it's working fine. So I'm going to put my two fingers underneath the hook. I'm going to put the hair on top of the hook, then I'm going to hold it down with my index finger. And then I'm going to make just two wraps for this first one. And then I'm going to pull the hair down between my fingers. And then I'm going to keep it from spinning by holding my middle finger on the hair. Then I'm going to use my thumb and index finger to pull the hair out of the way. And then I'm going to make four wraps to anchor. And if I do this right, I've now covered the hook 180 degrees. 180 degrees on top of the hook. And that's my goal. I want 180 on top and 180 on the bottom. Okay, so now the weight. 
So I'm going to make one or two wraps around the hair, pull the hair out of the way, make four wraps on the shank to anchor it. But hair being hollow, if you don't continue to have pressure on the thread, the hair will expand up. And what happens is the fly becomes very loose. And when I first started doing this technique without this weight, I'd catch four or five bass and the fly would fall apart. So it wasn't until I figured out that I needed to have that constant three to four ounces of pressure weight on the thread that I got really good tight ties. And by using this technique with this weight, I've caught as many as 50 bass on a single fly without it falling apart. Okay, so let me do this again. I'm gonna alternate color. So on the bottom, I'm gonna go with orange. This time I'm gonna pull the hair out of the way. I'm gonna move the thread, the bobbin out of the way, transfer the hair from my right hand to my left hand, pinch it in place like I did before. This time I'm just gonna make one wrap and I'm gonna pull down and flare the hair out. This is why I call it flaring. And I'm gonna move the hair out of the way, keep it from spinning and do my four anchor wraps. And I'm gonna push the thread back to start stacking. I shouldn't say stacking, starting to pack the hair in. And that's it, that's the technique. And so it's a matter of going all the way down the hook, alternating colors. So if I go back to this pattern, this is a, a four color pattern. Start with a green, a lot of green, do a little bit of, a medium amount, I would say of orange, then do a little bit of black to get that little black stripe. Then I do a, a yellow, then I do a green, an orange, a black, a yellow, a green, an orange, a black, and you just follow that, that sequence all the way down until you get to the nose. And I finish it off with orange and green on the nose. So could you show that, could you show at least one layer of the black? Sure. So Thanks. you saw I, I had quite a bit of green and quite a bit of orange. To get that thin stripe, I'm only gonna cut about Mm, 15 or 20 black hairs. See, it's only a little bit. And remember, you're folding it on itself. When it flares up, it folds on itself. So what you're putting on is twice, effectively twice what you've got in your fingers. One wrap. Oh, and see, now that orange didn't get out of the way. I got to get the orange out of the way. One wrap. Pinch it between my fingers, keep it from spinning, four anchor wraps. And then you can move it around, can move the hair around and get it to where it's 180 degrees. And then I'm gonna get my packer in there and pack it down. Next, I'm gonna do yellow because I want alternating orange and yellow stripes on the bottom of the fly. And I want the stripes to be about the same size. Pull the hair out of the way. Transfer from right to left hand. Pinch it between my fingers. One wrap. Flare it. Keep it from spinning. Pull it back. Four wraps. Done. So if you learn this technique, you can, you can build flies very quickly. And it goes really fast. I'm going to do it this time without talking and show you how fast you can get going. Oops. A little bit of black on top. Yellow is next. And then finish off with the green on top.
So we just got a question on thread. This is FiMaster, um, FiMaster A plus. It's an old one, so it's you can use two ten or two forty denier. But I love FiMaster. That's what I've used forever. Lots of other threads you can use. That's just my preference, just because I've used it for so long. Okay. Any questions on that? I'm so stunned right at this stage of the game. I thought I knew how to tie flies, and now I don't. Find out I don't. <laughs> <clears throat> So some of the things you can do with this technique. Um, let me go ahead and tie this off. While because you're, you're not. While you're tying that off, explain how long it took you to figure out the ballasting so that your fly wouldn't turn over because I've, I've suffered uh, with that myself and, and I'm learning what I need to do with some of my flies. So please explain that. Trial and error and lots of work in the field. I tell my wife a lot, you know, I'm designing this fly and I just can't get it. I need to go test it some more. So I need to go fishing again. Yeah, it's just all field work. And, and I, I do spend time in the pool with the flies too, to make sure that they have the correct action that I want. It's just, it's a matter of experimenting out. All right, let me tie this off. Dutch, you had a question, but it didn't come across all the way. So I don't know what the question was. Is there some reason you can't? David, is there a particular reason you don't rotate the vice? You can. It just it's habit Dutch. This is why I've learned to do it because I want to make sure that I keep the the vice just straight up and down. If not, sometimes what will happen is the colors will creep up on one side higher than the other side. So by keeping it level, I know I'm when I get that 180 degrees that I'm looking for. I'm making sure that it's balanced on both sides, that the colors came up the same distance on both sides. Got it. You can rotate it. I mean, there's no reason you can't. Oh, what you were saying is, can you do this, turn it upside down and then put it on top again? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, so when you're done, you get a hairball. So I'm going to show you how to trim, Al, how to trim that mohawk minnow. Well, you know, I really was going to do a frog on this one. I'm going fishing tomorrow in a bass lake, so I was going to do a frog. So let me trim this out for a frog. And if we have time, we'll go back to the mohawk minnow. So when you're trimming, uh, the first thing you cut is what I call the reference cut, which is the cut smallest to the, to the hook. Because what I'm going to show you how to do next is how to do something like this. This is the this is the lily pad jumping frog. And let me explain this to you why this is, for me at least, an important design. When I don't know if y'all fish lily pads or not. I love fishing lily pads. They're so much fun, but it's a real challenge because what happens when a regular weed guarded fly goes over a lily pad? The the fly will turn sideways as it goes over the edge of the lily pad and the edge of the lily pad will push the weed guard out of the way and you get caught on the edge of the lily pad. Can you all see that? Does that make sense? The lily pad pushes sure the weed guard does. out of the yeah. way. Yes. So when I was fishing a regular weed guard, even with this is a stinger hook, even with a stinger hook, I spent an 80% of the time getting unhung. So I tried to figure out how I could create a fly that, that wouldn't be a problem. And I came up with this design. So here's what happens. And, and again, flaring allows you to put things like bucktail. This is bucktail. And I put some uh, soft text on it so it's really stiff. What happens is when the this frog pattern comes up to the lily pad, the edge of the lily pad, let me do it this way, edge of the lily pad, instead of it turning sideways with these two legs, what happens, it actually jumps up on top of the lily pad. So. I can cast this fly 30 feet back into the lily pads and hop it across all the lily pads. And instead of getting hung 70 to 80% of the time, usually 95% of the time, I, am, I don't get hung at all. Well, you don't have any bad nightmares either, do you? <laughs> no, my nightmare is, even though I use 20-pound test tippet when I'm fishing lily pads, that I hang on to a 
a five or seven pound bass and he goes so far to the lily pads I can't control him I lose him anyway that's my nightmare so because you're not spinning again because you're not spinning you can now put material into the hair so let me show you how to do that let me trim this out real quick so I'm going to make that first cut that reference cut which is going for a frog pattern you want it on the bottom. So my first cut is going to be on the bottom. If you notice, I don't use razor blades. People usually ask that. And I came up with this technique with my son, who was three years old at the time, sitting in my lap. So razor blades, razor blades were not allowed, according to my wife, and for good reason. So I learned to do all this with scissors. And so I use uh, Dr. Slick serrated scissors. I love these scissors. Okay, so you can see the stripes. I use green and yellow for this frog pattern. Okay, so we got the bottom cut. Next, we're gonna cut the sides. So we wanna make sure we cut the sides the same distance from the shank. And we're gonna taper it back toward the back. Okay, so I gotta get that balanced. Make sure it's just right. Okay, looks good. And I'm going ahead and cut the top. And this is the part my wife loves, all the deer hair. Okay, so if you notice, I haven't gone all the way out to the eye of the hook. So I'm gonna show you how to put that bucktail in there to form the legs. So I'm not gonna trim this completely, just enough where the hair is out of the way and I get the bucktail in. Now you can see the dark stripes across the top, those thin stripes. Okay. All right. I'm going to put some green legs on this one. So I'm going to cut some bucktail. And I want some very long bucktail for this. And that'll be evident in a little while. So I'm going to get out the short strands because I only want long ones. And then I want it to be even the entire length of the leg. And the butts are thicker than the ends. So what I'm going to do is take half of it and flip it. And now I've got butts and tips on both sides, both ends. All right, let me get my thread started. So I'm gonna take the bucktail and I'm gonna put it on the hook using a figure eight. And this is actually just a little bit tricky to do because it has a tendency to wanna to spin on you as you go around. I don't have to put a lot of thread on here because I'm going to glue this in place. I just want enough thread to hold it where I want it. Okay. So there's one leg. Oh, see, it's trying to spin on me. And I'm going to get some more bucktail. Get the short stuff out and take half of it and flip it. This is where it gets trickier. The second leg is always harder than the first. And so I'm gonna do a figure eight. Okay, got both legs in place. I'm gonna pack them down. And then, looks like a mess right now, but when we 
we get the rest of the deer hair on there and I'll show you how to get the legs to stay in place. Okay, and I'm gonna hit it with the soft tex and glue those in place. Okay, now pack that in. And now we can keep going. And so the next one I need on there is a yellow on the bottom to, to follow my pattern. And again, now if I was spinning and I tried to put some hair on here and spin it on, what would happen? My bucktail would go all over the place. Because I'm keeping it uh, the deer hair in place, I can go straight on the hook. And I'm going to do a. Let's see, my next color is a little, little black. I missed it. As long as I can get over that eye and on the shank, I can still put hair on. Okay, there's my black. Next is a big chunk of green. Then go back to yellow. This is the boring part. You're know, watching me put hair on the hook. I have to tell you, I'm not bored. I don't know about the rest of the people. Nobody's left, so we're, you're doing good. <laughs> And then I can whip finish that. Are you going to show us the weed guard to that? You no, know, I was hoping nobody else had noticed that I forgot to put the weed guard on it. <laughs> you caught me. It's okay. It's okay. But we can talk about weed guards. Because um, there's actually a lot to know about weed guards and how to do them the different ways. And there's a bunch of different ways to do weed guards. And I'll pull up some flies to show you what I mean by that. Okay, now to trim this out, I'm gonna go ahead and trim. Looks like a hairy mess, doesn't it? I'm gonna go ahead and trim the top. And to make sure, because I want those that bucktail to extend down his legs, I'm gonna grab that bucktail. The reason I, I wanted it so long is so I can grab it. It has to be longer than the deer hair grab it and pull it out of the way and then I can trim around it.
grab the bucktail, pull it out of the way, and now trim. How are we doing on time, Al? We're doing great on time. I'm just, I was sitting here with my mouth hanging open watching what you're doing there. I was get too slow getting to my microphone. Sorry. So. <laughs> oh, you know what? I just pulled out a bunch of that hair. I didn't let the glue dry. Well, oh, shoot. Oh, well. So let me, I have one leg. Let me go ahead and show you the technique for the leg. What you do. I was too impatient. I didn't wait until the glue dried all the way. And so when I was messing with it, I pulled it out. That's okay, we can do one leg. So what you do next is you get some thread, cut you about 10 inches of thread, and then do a double hitch on the thread. I say double hitch a granny knot. And that pulls the legs in. And then get the soft text out again. And you saturate those legs with soft text to get them nice and stiff. Is that thinned out in any ways? Nope. This is right out of the bottle. Fresh bottle. Yes, it is okay. a fresh bottle. It's okay, a new thank one. You. Yes. Thank you. Very good observation. And then get that thread at the right where you want it, and then trim it off, and there's your leg. Is there a reason that you put the legs on in two bunches rather than just all one big bunch? That's a really good question because I've never thought of doing it that way before. I, I don't know if it'd be possible because of the angle. You want the legs coming out at a, at a, at a good angle. Hmm, I have to think about that. I may try that. Okay. And again, we, we had another person ask about the thread. As I recall, you said you're using like 210 denier or something similar? Yeah. Yeah, Flymaster Plus, a 210 or 240 can be used. All right. Well, sorry I missed up that other leg, but you get an idea then. So, Again, so that flaring <laughs> allows you to be able to put materials in. Have so I'm going to show you. Have you ever considered uh, using like a UV as a, a way of holding those together rather than the thread technique? Yeah, I just, I don't like UV a lot. Um, we get into a real philosophical discussion about UV. The, one of the things I do, and some people think I'm nuts, is I taste everything I put on my flies. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gretchen. That's usually the response I get. But here's why. Here's why I do that. I was tying up a, a mohawk minnow. I was getting ready to go fishing the next day. And it was in a real clear pond. It was a sand pit. I was going fishing. So I wanted some sparkle on the fly. So I couldn't figure out how to get sparkle in the hair. I eventually did figure it out, but it took me a while. But so I wanted sparkle on the hair. So what I did is I, I mixed up some epoxy and put some glitter in it and then dubbed it on the outside of the hair. Well, it turned out it was 24-hour epoxy. I tied it one night. I got up the next morning to go fishing with that fly. And th this is a private sand pit. It has a ton of bass in it. It's where I did a lot of my field work on fly designs. And I started fishing with that fly, and I was only getting hookups one out of every three hits, which for bass fishing is a very, very low percentage. I was going, what the heck's going on here? So I took that fly off, and I put one of my other flies on, another Mohawk minnow that didn't have the epoxy on it. And then I started getting hookups three out of four hits which is normal. So in, instead of one out of three hookups per hit, I got, I went to three out of four hookups per hit. <clears throat> and what I figured out was the bass were sticking that fly that had the epoxy in their mouths 
And before I could set the hook, they were tasting that epoxy and spitting the fly out. That's the only thing I could figure out. So I've tried several of the UVs and some of them are really nasty tasting. I had some, and I don't remember which UV it was, a year after I, I tied it, cured it, I could still taste the nasty stuff in it. So I, I haven't found a UV yet that doesn't leave a taste. So I kind of have gone away from UVs, but that's one reason I use Softex a lot because when it dries, it has no taste. And the lacquer that I use is a water-based lacquer. It dries and has no taste. Okay, moving on. Any other questions? Next, we're gonna do the rattle mold. I'm gonna show you how to do the rattle mold. So we did the lily pad jumping frog. So you saw the technique for doing the deer hair, even though I messed it up. So here, here's the rattle mold. Now this is the pattern that Umco picked up 20 something years ago and they've been mass producing it ever since. And the, we call them finger mullet. There's two species of mullet along the Texas coast, silver mullet and striped mullet. And the mullet go offshore and spawn. And then in the early spring, the fry, the eggs and the fry come into the bays. And that's where they mature until they get about, I don't know, 16, 18 inches long. Then they'll go offshore to spawn, but they'll, they'll come back into the bays. So they go, as adults, they go offshore to spawn and come back into the bays. So what we do is, we match the size of the finger mullet for the time of the year. So if you're fishing early in the year, you're gonna be throwing a shorter rattle mullet. This is a June rattle mullet. By this time, the, the, yearling, rattle, the yearling mullet are about four to four and a half, maybe five inches long. Now what makes this fly unique is using that flaring technique, I was able to embed a plastic rattle into the fly. I did this for a couple of reasons. The obvious one is it makes noise, but some of the research I've read is that, and this was for salmon and trout, they don't hear high frequencies. They only hear low frequencies. So they won't even hear this rattle. I don't know if redfish or trout can hear it or not. I hope they can. But the other reason was I had several guides along the Texas coast. I was working with them designing flies and they said, Ron, I need a fly that pushes water. I need a fly that's going to be wide. So you can see how wide that fly is. And that pushing water is important because the fish, their lateral lines, they can feel very sensitive, very small movements of water. When something goes through the water, it forms pressure waves underwater. We all know that. And so a fly that pushes more water, the fish are going to be able to feel it better and they'll come and get it. So by having that rattle, the fly is thick for the entire distance of the fly. You'll see a lot of mullet patterns where it's thick in the head. They'll use wool or synthetics, but then it gets very skinny. Like they'll have feathers or just a little bit of materials. This is thick all the way down the fly. So it pushes a lot of water. Okay, so this technique, and I'll show it to you, a flaring allows you to put hair over things. So this is the back end of the rattle mullet. There's two parts to tying a rattle mullet. The first part is getting the rattle on, getting this uh, crystal flash, getting the feathers, and getting bucktail over it. So it looks like this. It's got the bucktail all over it. So by flaring, get my thread started. I can take clumps of hair and put them around the rattle. And that weight is going to hold the, uh, the hair in place so that I can move it around and get it even.
So I'm going to take a clump of hair. I'm going to put it right on top. And I'm going to make one wrap, two wraps. And I'm not pulling down. I'm not flaring it. Now the weight is holding the hair in place. I can then move this hair around and get it even all the way around the rattle. Then I'll hold it in place to hold the hair in place. And then I can crank down on it and flare the hair. And then pull it out of the way and then anchor on the shank. In the next clump of hair, I'm gonna put directly on the shank and I'm gonna put a lot of hair. This is a very large amount of hair because it has to, if you remember, it has to butt up against the flat side of this rattle. So I need a lot of hair right in this area to fill that, that gap, that void, that space. I'm taking a large amount of hair. Same technique. And then I'll put a little bit on the bottom. I'm doing a single color on this one. I want to do. What do fish see? What is the color that is most visible underwater for the longest distance? Studies on bass have shown that it's chartreuse. There's a saying down on the South Texas coast. You talk to the guys, they say, yeah, what kind of flies do I need to bring? What kind of colors? Well, Colors don't matter just as long as you bring chartreuse. <laughs> we have the same saying in Idaho. I don't know what, and it's a long ways away from the salt down there in, in Texas. Yeah, it's because the studies that they've done, chartreuse just travels further underwater. That color travels further and can be seen further away than any other color. And then I'll get one more little bunch on the bottom. As long as you can get that thread around the eye of the hook, you can get hair right, right to the edge. This is a lot of fun trying to get your whip finish on with all that hair. Okay, I'm not gonna bother to do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit here for a minute and mess with that. Okay, got, got the idea though? How with the weight? Yeah, yeah we sure do, yes. Put, put hair around whatever you wanna put it around. Okay, there was a question about weed guards. Let's talk about weed guards real quick. Um, let me, so here's, here's your standard weed guard. And the trick with weed guards is where do you tie them in? Let me do this one so you can see. So this is a stinger hook. It's got a really long part of the shank right here. The higher up you tie in the weed guard, you tie it in way up here, the less weedless it is, but the more hookups you'll get. As you go down, you become more weedless and less likely to get hookups. I've seen, I've seen some people tie in all the way down to here. It's very, very weedless, but you gotta have a fish that really bites down on it to get that monofilament out of the way. And I usually use, uh, for my weed guards, I use Andy because it's uh, monofilament because it's very stiff and it's very cheap. And for a fly like this, I think this is 50. For smaller flies, I'll use 30. Now, in some situations, a full weed guard is not applicable. If you all noticed, and we, if you buy a rattle mullet, and please do, because I get about a nickel, uh, there is no full weed guard. And the reason is, 
that this is for speckled sea trout. We call them specks. They're in the weak fish family and they have very soft mouths. And also when they hit, they swipe. They come across the fly and they swipe really fast. And so if there's a full weed guard, even if you tie it in up high, it becomes troutless, it becomes speckless. <clears throat> so the, the plant that we're trying to keep off the hook is called shoal grass in South Texas. It has what well, looks like pine needles. It grows on the bottom. It's about five, six inches long. And if a prop cuts it or it dies, it floats to the top. And so you've got these like pine needles all over the place in the water. So you need something that's going to keep that soil grass off. So something stiff enough to keep it off the point, but not so stiff that you can't catch a speck. So that's why the, the rattle mullet has this kind of weed guard. Now, in extreme cases, extreme cases, I'll do a double loop. I was trying to get an example of a double loop. But I don't remember where that fly box is. The problem is having too many fly boxes. So yeah, it, instead of a single loop, you can take a monofilament and tie one end here, then loop it around the eye, tie it off the eye, then bring it back and tie it off again on the hook. And then you'll have two monofilament loops. I use that when I go snook fishing because you're casting up into the mangroves. So, oh, here's one right here, shoot. Here you go. So two, tied in one, loop it around the eye, tied in at the eye, come back around, tied off again. So this is real weedless. You can cast that up in the mangroves and it usually won't get hung. But still a snook, a snook will crank down on it and still you'll get a good hookup. How are we doing on time, Al? Um, you're, you're a little bit past 45, but I, I've been so uh, in awe of everything you were doing. I, I didn't want to slow you down. We do have a question, though. Uh, sure. A fellow asked, what is the blue plastic thing on your rice? <laughs> I was and at the at South Fred, Roundup. Fred, Fred Dupre wanted to know that. Oh, Fred. Hey, Fred. How you doing? So uh, I was at the South Bug a couple of weekends ago, first time I've ever gone. What a phenomenal fly tying festival. I had so much fun. I met so many amazing people. I got to sit right next to Mike George and tie with him. That was, that was worth the trip right there. Somebody was passing these out. I don't remember who. Dutch, do you remember who was passing these out? Ron, they must have uh, passed them all out before they got to our table. <laughs> I didn't see them. Somebody was passing these out, and these are just little clips where you can hang things off of. Like when you're tying complicated flies and you need to hang a material or hang, like, like when you're tying salmon flies and you've got your ribbing and you need to get it out of the way, you can droop it over this and it keeps it from getting in your way. That's all it is. Uh, wait just a minute. Chris wanted to know when you were trying to put some sparkle in, in your frog, have you thought about uh, tying in some flesh with each bundle of hair. That is actually the solution I came up with. Oh, okay. But it wasn't. But it wasn't crystal flash. One Easter, I went to Pottery Barn, and I bought every kind of sparkly whatever they had, and I found this material. It's Easter basket filling. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah. And he, here's the catch. If you use crystal flash in the hair, when you cut the hair, the crystal flash will not show up. If you use something that's really big and wide, uh, let me see if I can dig this out. So this is for Christmas trees. But you see how wide it is, how thick it is? If you try and put that in the hair, it impedes the flaring. So you can't use something that's really big and thick. So oh, I tried a bunch of materials and this is what worked. It's a little bit kinky. It's not too thick. It's not too wide. And it's really very thin. 
So yes, you can do this. You can. Let me show you how you do this. Wait, I was just gonna say, would you mind doing that? <laughs> no, not at all. Let me show you how to do this stuff. So what you have to do is, I'm gonna use black so it'll show up really well. This is a really good piece of black hair. So what I do is I get the black hair and I put it on a flat surface and I pull out a little bit of this Easter basket material and then that's too much, that will impede. Okay, and then I fold it into the hair. It's much easier to do on a flat surface. And then when I put it on, It still flares okay. It doesn't impede the flaring. And now you've got that flash. And I have a missing box of flies. I don't know where that box is. That has an example of what it looks like after you trim it. But because this is the right thickness, that even after you trim it, it shows up in the hair. So you do get some sparkle. That shows up really good there. That was a really, a really good the way I, you turn that over and it shows right up. Yeah. Wow. So could you talk a little bit about trimming the mohawk on that pat on the other fly, how you get it so neat? Yeah, so here's this, the scissor technique to do it. I don't know if I have time to tie a full body one up and then show you how, so I'll show you how I did it on this one. So again, the, the reference cut is the cut that's closest to the shank. And on this pattern, instead of like a frog it being on the bottom, you cut the side first. So you cut each side and you trim it because you, you want this profile. You, because the bass are gonna be feeding from underneath, you want that profile of a, of a, of a sunfish from the underside. So you trim it and I always hold it here, if you notice, so I don't trim off the dang feathers because they're really hard to put back on. <laughs> so you trim it down to your fingers, hopefully you don't cut your fingers. So you make this cut and this cut. And the next thing you do then is, and this is why these scissors, these Dr. Slick scissors, because they're pretty thick. What you do is you push down on the hair and cut, push down and cut push down and cut. And you want the tips of your scissors to be right even with the shank. So you're only trimming the hair that's below the shank. So you just go up and down, you trim, 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 trim. And then you cut this angle that you want for the profile. And then you further thin it out by doing this until you get as little hair as you can with still having the profile. Then you trim the backs and get them partially trimmed, trim the nose, and then trim the hair down the sides so that the mohawk is still there. So you just take that down and trim it. And the last thing you do is you trim the mohawk. Very good, thank you. Who was it that asked that question just out of curiosity? Chuck Ballard. I don't know. Chuck, yeah. yeah. If you guys want to stick around, we I can tie one of these, but it's going to, it's about a 15 minute start to finish tie. God, we don't have anything to do but watch reruns on television. <laughs> My God. Just, but pick up, you can pick up the pace until you get to a point where, where you need to slow down and illustrate something and then move right on. Okay. Then. Let's do a mohawk minnow from the beginning. All right, so to go fast, I'm not going to talk a whole lot, if that's okay with y'all. Here's my weed guard. Monofilament is very slick. Whenever you tie it in, you want to get some sandpaper and scratch it. Otherwise, it'll pull right out. By scratching it, the thread and the lacquer will grab hold of it and it'll stay in. So to make sure it's on straight, I'm going to put it down through the middle of my vise. 
and get it into place. And I'm going fishing in a place tomorrow that has a lot of grass, but it's soft grass and it's not usually on the surface. So I'm not gonna tie this way down the shank. I'm gonna leave it fairly high so that I get good hookups. I want you to know that my wife just called and I sent her to voicemail. Oh, so. okay, well, it, it cut off that camera. <laughs> so I, I've got you on the other camera right now. Sorry well, about you, that. You got, you got so. it back on, okay, good. Let me get yeah. it. All right. So hopefully I'm not in trouble. So I'm getting some tail feathers and a little bit of crystal flash. So crystal flash, like all synthetics, and then fold it over. That way it won't pull out. Okay, and I got my two tail feathers. This is something I learned from the salmon fly tires because I don't like tying feathers in because the stems are always, they compress and the feather goes wherever you want it to go. So you take a pair of pliers and you squash them flat. And then they'll stay where you put them, usually. Okay. All right, now comes the deer hair. Okay, so I'm gonna do a four hair pattern again. So I'm gonna do green, just, I'm gonna do this, this same pattern. I like that pattern a lot. It's been very effective. I still lined up with all the cameras. Oh. Yes, we're still doing good. I've been I've been working you back and forth here. Okay. So I'm going to do a green, orange, black, yellow pattern, and I'm going to use pretty large clumps of hair so I fill the hook up faster. Usually, I won't use this much hair, so I like the stripes to be a little bit thinner but for the sake of time. Scares me when we get this quiet. Anybody have any good jokes? No, we're we're enthralled with what you're doing here. I know we're, we all have that same sickness. Is it? It's called a, a thread wrap virus, I think, or something like that. What? Thread wrap virus. We all have it. That's why we're so quiet and in, enthralled with what you're doing. Uh, Rick says uh, two wraps around the first clump of hair and one on the second or on the rest. Is that what you do? Yes, that was a very good observation. I didn't point that out, but that first clump of hair, I do want to anchor it a little bit better just because it's the first one. So I use two wraps on the first one. Then after that, it's just one. And do you know who makes a little blue thingy? I don't remember the guy's name. He was just walking around, passing around, saying, hey, isn't this cool? And we all said, yeah, thank you. Hey, Ron, this is Jerry Chris out of Oregon. Hey, do you ever mix mix colors in, 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 one of the, in one of the stacks? Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, I do. Oh, okay. I've done that, right. that many times. If you want to get that more subtle color. Yeah, just a, just a variegated, more of a variegated look in them. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a technique to doing that. You have to put the hair on a flat surface. Uh, and maybe Mike George showed you how to do this. Put it on a flat surface and just mix it together. Just turn it over and turn it over and turn it over until you get it evenly spread out. Yeah, it's almost like mixing a salad. Yeah. 
but trying to keep the ends together that's the tough part oh yeah <clears throat> yeah and and with this technique i've done things like see I'm, I'm alternating on the bottom and on the top but sometimes i'll just put a small stripe on the sides even use a small amount of hair on each side so you get a very it, a very thin stripe that only goes about halfway up the side. So this technique, you can use a lot of creativity to mimic pretty much any bait fish you can imagine. It's, it's like that Christmas tree stuff. You, you notice that Ron had a big piece of it probably because he's not using very much of it. No, the, the only reason I use that is we have a bay anchovy that, oh, what am I doing? Look at that, I put it on the top. See, I knew I was gonna get messed up. Uh, we have a bay anchovy called a silver side and it has a very silvery bright stripe along the side. And so that's what I use that material for is if I'm tying up an anchovy pattern. Oh, okay. Side pattern. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll stop distracting you here. We want you to get in the right place. <laughs> <clears throat> and if i'm really doing a serious job like i'm tying for a flight tying contest i'll pre-cut all the hair so that i have for each stripe i have the same amount so that it's very even up and down the fly but most of the time i'm just the fish don't really mind that much so if I'm tying fast, I'm, I won't be as accurate as if I'm, if I pre-cut everything. And then you get a pat or fly that looks perfect. I'm getting near the nose. So I'm gonna stop alternating colors and just do green and orange out to the end. As in most bait fish that I've seen, the color horizontal stripes are from the gill plate toward the tail. And you usually don't see those kind of stripes in front of the gill plate. Oh, and I have been known to put, like on the battle mullet, put a red stripe in there for the gills. I've talked to some guides and they swear putting that red in there makes a big difference. So the guides say, man, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I can fit one more clump of green on there, I believe. I'm going to move this out of the camera a little ways so I can get my whip finish done. Got it. Okay, now the trimming. So again, we're going to start with our reference cut. And on this fly, it's on the sides. And my fingers are keeping me from cutting off the tail feathers. So you can see the stripes. And Yeah, you see Dutch, I didn't get this. I wasn't paying close enough attention. See how the orange and red go very high up on this side and not so high on this side. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happens when you rush. 
Okay. All right, so we got the sides just about even, same distance from the eye of the hook. Um, let me see, get down on both sides. Now we're going to cut the belly. And again, tapering down, get that profile. Let's see. And I'm going to hold it this way and make sure I'm even above and below the hook shank so that I get that nice perch profile. Okay, now to make the keel. That's what some people call it, the keel. So I'm going to take my scissors and push down and cut the hair. Go to the other side, do the same thing. And there you go. That's how you build the keel. Mm. Still a little, a little bit thick. And that profile is not quite what I want. It's a little bit too much. So I'm going to trim that profile down. There, and that's the profile that I want. Still a little bit thick in places. So I'm going to trim a little bit more off. Okay. I'm going to do the nose. And then if I've got stragglers, I'll cut them off like this. And if I get too much hair on the bottom, it's gonna, the fly is going to flip. Don't want that. That's still too much. <clears throat> okay. I'm starting to curve along the back now to get that back formed. And I'll do it on the other side. smooth and even on the sides. Actually, you can tell he's never done that before by the way he trims that. <laughs> the, uh, the flaring is the technique. The trimming it so that it's even is really the, it's the art, <clears throat> the art part of it. And that's much harder to teach getting the symmetry because as we all know the flies need to be symmetrical so they don't spin in the air or not not go through the water straight so that makes a big difference in catching fish if it doesn't look natural you decrease your chances of catching the fish okay 
Okay, Mohawk's almost ready to be trimmed. Okay, that looks pretty good. And there's my punk fly. Getting there. Okay, so the next thing is to make sure you don't cut the feathers off. So what I do is I kind of pull the feathers out of the way and get the last of this hair trimmed. Okay, that's the general shape. Then how are we doing on time, Al? Oh, we're we're doing fine. You got you've got about five five more minutes or so, and but we okay. we have no time limit, so you take what you need because this is really good stuff. Okay. So now we'll put on the the weed guard. Now when I'm doing weed guards for the saltwater flies. The hooks usually have very large eyes. So I'll take the monofilament up through the eye and tie it off, and that's very secure. On these hooks, these freshwater hooks, the eyes are not big enough to do that. So you have to go one side or the other. All right, so I measure where I want it. I mark it with my fingers and then scratch it. I'll show you another little trick uh, for making sure that your, your weed guard doesn't pull out. Ever seen one of these? A guy in our club sells them. And it's a little, like when we, had, we were kids and we had those little burning irons for wood. Yeah. This one's nice because it has a, a little dial on it for the temperature. And he makes some amazing hot wax flies with it. But what you can do after this warms up, you can cut the monofilament. It's not quite warm yet. And what that does is it forms a little burr there on the mono. And that keeps it from being from pulling out there. Now I know for sure that's not going to pull out. Last thing to do is get some eyes on it, and then we're ready to go fishing. So I love these solid doll eyes. I love them, love them, love them. Because if you've ever seen, if you've ever swam with a fish, let's see where did that fly go. Their eyes stick out a little bit and they can see down, they can see all the way around because those eyes stick out. So these doll eyes very much mimic a real fish's eyes, I believe. So you take the doll stem, and if you can get these little pliers, then you can cut them off very close to the back of the eye. Now, I went many, many years ago, I went to Home Depot and I bought every glue in the store because I kept having eyes fall off. And this is what I found. Loctite stick and seal outdoor, not indoor, outdoor. You want the outdoor adhesive because it has the nasty chemicals in it that melt the plastic. The glue actually melts the plastic. So instead of having eye glue hair, what happens because this melts the plastic, the, the hair actually goes into the plastic. 
anyway, I hardly ever, ever have eyes fall off. I've even been out at the jetties fishing and hit the rocks with my fly and the half of the eye will break off and the other half will stay on. That's how tough it is. Uh, what was the name of that stuff again? Loctite. Stick and seal. Stick and seal outdoor, not the indoor. It's so, you see what I did is I put, I put a little bit of glue on my needle and then I touched my needle to the eye to grab hold of it and then put it on. And the reason I do it this way is because this glue is so nasty. As soon as it gets on that plastic, it melts it. So if you get it on the front side of the eye, you cannot get it off. It's already messed up the eye. So again, I get a little bit of glue on my needle. I pick up my eye and put it on. And any excess, I'll take the side of my needle and just pull it off. Then I wanna make sure that they're even from all directions. And there you go. There's the Mohawk minnow. Oh, one more thing. Don't want the crystal flash that long. Okay, done. Great presentation, Ron. Just absolutely great. Again, great presentation. Uh, anything else, Ron? Well, I, I'm a professional presenter at my work. I'm actually a presentation mm -hmm. coach. And what we always say is if there's no questions, that means one of two things. Either you did a really good job or you bored everybody to death. <laughs> so hopefully it was A and not B. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's A because uh, <laughs> all of the same people are still with us. So we didn't lose that was, anybody. That was excellent. Yeah, out, and absolutely outstanding. Anything else, Ron? No, uh -uh. other than go try out the technique of flaring. Go get yourself a little, actually, I call this my third hand bobbin weight. Go get yourself a third hand bobbin weight. Try this technique out and, and go experiment because there's so many, so many ways you can use this technique to tie whatever bait fish pattern you can imagine. Or frog, or salamander. Tip of the week. And I know just how much Ron loves <laughs> UV glue, but we're going to be talking about <laughs> UV glue. And it's because of a friend... Uh, that we've been in contact through the, the fly fishing and digital world, Rick Ziegler in Iowa. He suggested that a great substitute for the UV glues we use in fly tying was um, a product uh, used in 3D printing. It's UV resin for 3D printing. And you see a, a jug of it laying there along with some um, gloves and my static guard, which is always there. And then I've got a um, flashlight that goes with the Cure Cure glue or solar, uh, solar is, and a bottle of new um, 3D UV glue, we call it. Really, a really our original name. I'll set that over at the vise. And we'll talk about this for a minute. This is 500 uh, grams of any cubic 3D printing, the UV um, that way, sensitive uh, resin. That's the stuff. And so how much is 500 grams? We were talking about that the other several weeks ago and uh, didn't have any idea. Well, anyway, I filled 15 of these one ounce UV glue containers today. So it, and, and part of another one. So it's about 15 and a half. So it's not quite uh, a pint. That's what 15 grams is. And uh, that's for a very reasonable price on Amazon. Uh, the price for this size right here is just about the same price as one of the small solar res glues that you buy at the, at the normal fly fishing locations. But let's move back to the fly tying vise. 
Now you all, all should recognize this. And while I'm changing glasses, you can take a look at it. This is a fly that we tied a couple of weeks ago. It's the cheapy streamer that looks an awful lot like a, like a muddler. Except one thing, you notice the nice head that we have on that thing. Well, that's done with this 3D UV resin. We're going to show you just how it works. It's some, some pretty amazing stuff, at least the one that we got, the bicubic one. There's, a, there's just gobs of them on Amazon, so I don't know what to tell you the, in that regard, but I'll take this out of the device here real quick and <clears throat> show you just a couple of the things I've learned in playing with this with this resin. First off, I'm going to turn my light on and then set it down so it's pointed down at the table so I don't have to dink around trying to click click it on when I'm got red wet glue on the on the on the fly. Now here's the one thing I found out with these with this particular kind of a bottle is you don't want to hold it so it can gradually run to the tube because what happens is it comes out real fast. Turn that puppy up just like that. And in, in the suction inside keeps it from running away on you. So now I'm just going to set that down. We've got some new newly applied stuff on that. And here's what's so great about this. This sets up instantly. Now that looks just wet as can be, and that's just as rock hard as can be. So isn't that amazing? But anyway, that's 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 the UV glue. Now I'll hey, just set. How hey, can you taste that for me? See what it tastes like. Uh, it it tastes <laughs> like UV, and and you and you don't and you don't want to you don't want to be messing with that. You didn't taste it. I did not taste it. <laughs> I smelled the stuff today, uh, filling those fifteen and. Anyway, I'm going to do another one here just for the heck of it. And if you don't squeeze the bottle, it comes out really slow because of the suction inside of that bottle. And so we're really pleased with it. This is this actually works as good as our solar res or any of the others. A couple of weeks ago, we tried the the women's fingernail gel, and that didn't didn't work quite as good. But this this does an absolutely gorgeous job. I'll do another one here real quick. Now, when you get down, could you show that bottle again? Yeah, I sure will. Thank you. Anyway, you notice that that doesn't come out too fast, but boy, if you even squeeze that bottle a little bit, it doesn't just come out, it gushes out. So just the word to the wise. And, and how do I know that? Well, that's because I'm giving you the heads up warning right now and we're gonna go ahead and <laughs> cure that. And there it is, nicely cured, rock solid, hard, nice and shiny. And anyway, that's, that's the tip. And I've got 15 of these bottles. So if you'll email me right here to this email address, email me your address, the first 15 people, actually the first 14 people, because I'm keeping one for me. <laughs> the first 14 people will get one and I'll send it to you. And my cost in the thing is somewhere's around, well, with shipping and everything, it, a little bit shy of 10 bucks. If you're interested, great. We'll send one to you and you can you can play with it. And I'll even throw in one of these. And I'll show you. We'll go back to the camera for the for the vice. And what is this? Well, this is something else that I picked up on on YouTube that some of the solar res comes with is a little spigot like that. Well, this thing will not fit on this but i'll show you what i did find that seems to work pretty well let me take this off and what i can do now is i can put this on here and really push it down hard and then i'm able to have it out on the end now not real thrilled about the way that is because it could just pop off but if you want one of those just tell me and i'll throw it in the in the in the mix but anyway 
that's it for for the. Can you show uh, the bottle one more time, Al? Uh, oh this yes, Jerry. thank you, thank you, Jerry. I'll do that right now. Uh, okay, it's called Any Cubic, A N Y C B C U B I C, and it's three D printing UV sensitive resin. It's basic, and I want you to notice that it's a UV wavelength of 405 nanometers. Now, I don't know what a nanometer is. I won't even try to con you on that. <laughs> it's something to do with light, and it's way beyond my level of comprehension. All I can tell you is that a solar res or a cure, clear cure goo flashlight does a really great job on it, as you saw tonight. 